All right, lads, welcome back to Hearts Farm for the New Order, and welcome to the Francis Parker Yaki Experience. Our patron, Ryan McCready, requested this series af or after the conclusion of our series as Margaret Chase Smith. However, I've been pretty busy with the whole leaving sort of thing, and I've been working, And I, but I today, at about uh, quarter past three, I finally have time to get stuck into it. And I'm looking forward to it, because it's, I mean, it's Yaki, what's not to like, apart from the fact, well, as in what's not to like is in the experience, not as in, you know, his actual ideology. Not that, not that he really even has one that's a whole thing that i've been looking i've been researching yaki and it just it just gets weirder and weirder but anyway i decided not to make this a full series simply because like you know just gaming america for like 17 or 18 episodes just you know destroying the nation in each and every um latest episode it, it'll just be a bit too gamey and you know it's like oh we're destroying the nation again and again and again so i decided to just condense it all down into one video where we shall be reading every single event for an or event or focus related to Francis Parker Yockey all the way up to and including his presidency. So there will be quite a lot of cuts um, throughout this video. I'll be pausing the recording, or no, I'll be pausing the recording quite a bit as we start. I'll, I'll be doing most of it off camera, much like uh, pretty much everything off camera. Well, yeah, unless it's related to Francis Parker Yockey or there's an event that that talks about him, or um, or just kind of mentions him in any other way. And then it won't be included because it, uh, you know, Francis Parker can only get inaugurated on like the 22nd of January 1973, I believe. Is it 72 or 73? I know he's a 72 candidate, but I think he gets elected on the 22nd of January 73. So it, it's like 11 years just for like 100 days of content, which is why I decided to do it all in one video. But I hope you shall enjoy this video. It's kind of the first video um, I'll be doing in this format. I imagine. Uh, I'll probably do Gus Hall much the same way um, when when we get around to doing Gus Hall, and um, after this video, I'll well no, no, not today because I've a lot to do with Yaki obviously, but I'll um, I think we'll be taking a step into um, Red Flood. Yes, as uh, th no points for guessing. Well, uh, yeah, moderate points for guessing who I'll be playing as. Um, one's an Italian and one's a Russian. But all right, lads, I hope you enjoy this video. And I shall see you again once we find our first event related to Francis Parker Yaki. I imagine it'll be the event um, during the South African conflict, where um, discontent is just starting to rise and Yaki gets to about 4% popularity and then he gets like the American National Vanguard event. Either way, see you then. Alright, we have our very first Yaki event, not even that far into the game either. Only February of, of uh, 62, German spy arrested, according to his landlord, Joseph Greenberg, was a rather unassuming fellow. He paid his rent on time, never had any noise complaints, and always helped old Mrs. Connors carry her groceries up the stairs. In reality, this was, lot with, uh, this was all a cover. Something the landlord learned when she opened Greenberg's empty apartment to the sight of piles of surveillance equipment and photos with Hackenkreutzes stamped upon them. Thinking quickly, she called the police, who in turn informed the FBI and arrested Greenberg this morning as he left for work. Joseph Greenberg was revealed to actually be Joseph Hansen. An agent for the German Abwehr. Um, ironically disguised as a small hat American, his mission was to secure a job at Bell Telephone, study their communications infrastructure, and identify flaws with the installation of wiretaps and other espionage methods. Even more concerning was that his phone book had the telephone number of several local NPP politicians inside, and it seemed he was trying to contact the party's fringe elements, including the bundle of sticksist agitator, Francis Parker Yockey. Charges for violation of the of the Espionage Act are already being brought against him, though he will likely end up simply being deported back to Germany rather than fleeing or rather than facing a long prison term in the United States. That's one less Hackenkreuzer to worry about. Indeed, it is. Conversations from the street. The two young men walked down the streets of LA basking in the midday sun, but the topic of their conversation was distinctly gloomier. So, did you hear about the Hackenkreutz spy, or the, yeah, I'll say Natsock, not Hackenkreutz anymore. About the Natsock spy they caught out in New York, they're saying he was trying to get in touch with Yaki of all people. It's crazy, isn't it, the other replied. I know how much they hate the Japs, hell, who doesn't around here, but I never thought they'd get in bed with the crowds. The spy was just reaching out to them, didn't say nothing about them agreeing to anything, the first man continued. The two men, like plenty of others out in California, had their own sympathies towards the NPP after all. Um, after all, everyone in LA or the Bay Area had to live only a few miles away from a humiliating reminder of 1945, and the NBP were the only ones who seemed to have any interest in getting the treaty ports back. He turned to his friend and asked, So, what do you think? Was Yaki in on it or nah? Sounds like a load of commie bull. Or sounds like a commie load of bull. Now the national mood will shift in favour of the National Progressive Party. Glorious. Into the fire. 
we have achieved apocalyptic discontent in the South African conflict. When John W. McCormick travelled to the Senate to ask, plead, even beg for another extension of the conflict measures, he'd prepared for a fiery welcome, but when he stopped for the first time in a month outside of the White House, he realised... Stopped? No, stepped. Um, he realised he couldn't have prepared for what he saw. The presidential convoy had to move in, uh, incognito, using civilian cars and pass through the suburbs to avoid the riots surrounding the White House and the Senate, and through the opaque glasses, the President looked... Um, and what he had done. Houses were shut down, some half burnt, and bands of petty criminals, demagogues, and political agitators from the Yaki and left NPP roamed the streets now that the police were entire or was entirely occupied uh, with preventing a total collapse of the state. Some banks had their glasses broken, general stores ha or were heavily guarded by private security, and all the common people had held the or had the same look in their face. Fear, fear for tomorrow, fear for the lost ability, but more than anything, Fear that this damn war will claim their loved ones too. When he descended from his car near the Senate, immediately the guards were around him. But this also made the crowd aware of his presence. Immediately a collective roar emerged and thousands tried to get to him. The president instinctively retreated, scared of the hate directed towards him. When, while the security tried to get to safely get him inside the building, then it happened. A single man managed to break through the shield and before the bodyguards could get him, he slapped the president of the United States of America. Immediately he was apprehended and cuffed. But John W. McCormick had felt in that slap he had felt everything the entire crowd had wanted to convey him. All the hate, all the vengeance, all the slap. It was as if the man had carved his entire face with a cleaver and then filled it with salt and vinegar. He knew it, he had failed. He had failed everything and everyone. As he was finally dragged inside the doors and the doors closed and the noise, he couldn't stop the tears from falling. This is the end. Yes, political power minus 200, base stability minus 5%, base conflict support minus 8%, already minus 26, good God. And there will be a rise in extremism. We are now at... 10% support for um, Natsakism and Yaki, and 9% uh, nine, nine support for Gus Hall and Othsok. Good God. Wow. Into the open. The streets of Birmingham echo once more with the cries of unrest. There is, uh, this is no mere po uh, protest, but a rally. It is organized and coordinated, and its members are filled with a feverish, a feverish passion. Their placards bear slogans of hatred, pictures of Yaki, and even small mustache man, and calls for liberal and progressive politicians to be lynched. They are greeted with a band of counter-protesters, and soon the city echoes with screams of sanity and fury. Soon both crowds have grown too large and unruly for the police to control, and the violence begins. The police gather in the remains of the salon. According to the owners, the thugs had come during the night and set the place alight, shouting racist obscenities as they did so. The former employees, all African American, weep at the loss of their livelihoods. This is the fifth report of arson in a month, uh, including two other black owned businesses, the office of the RD backed mayor, and a small hat family's residence. No evidence of the culprits is found, and the police leave with no further inquiries. More than one of them quietly smirks as they go. In the conference room in Washington, the Yaquiites meet. Their fundraising efforts have yielded more fruit than ever before. For the first time, they begin to talk of campaigning, of distributing media to the public, and pushing for their members to speak at MPP events. The mood is tearful, even if they do not quite have the influence yet to begin pushing their agenda. Every man in the room can feel the change in the air. Their time may finally be coming. The cracks are beginning to show, and from these those cracks pour the forces of reaction. All across the country, these ideas are beginning to take root, and no longer are those who hold them afraid to hide it. Those who hoped that the rise of extreme thought was a passing f uh, phase now grow increasingly nervous, and it remains to be seen how much further such ideology can spread. No more hiding, indeed. What's he at? Holy shit, he's at 15%. Good God, they're... Yeah, ha Hall and Yaki are both at 15%. Good God. That's absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible indeed. The Rot. In a southern town, a band of white-robed figures marches through the streets in numbers not seen in decades. Openly, loudly, proudly, they proclaim their defense of the white race against those who they say would destroy it. Once they would have been greeted with counter-demonstrators, now they march unimpeded. The clan's enemies stay away now, ever since the clash uh, which saw three dead and twenty-four beaten to within an inch of their lives. No longer do the town's police protect the clan's enemies from harm, no longer do the police hide their allegiance to the clan. In an idyllic clearing in the Appalachian, or Appalachian, Appalachian, yeah, woodlands, all is quiet save for the wind. As the gust begins to quicken, a slight tapping joins the fray. It is the gentle tapping of a black man's boots against a tree as he hangs from its branch. Suddenly, a second tapping joins him from the body hanging on the next tree. This one is not black. Those who seek to cleanse their community of the other have seen fit to hang a small hat this time. They are the third and fourth men to be hanged in that forest in a week. They will not be the last. In Washington, D.C., there was a disquiet where, there um, where before there would be a the veneer of civility from even the staunchest segregationist. Now there is open contempt to those who call for equality and greater government clarity are loudly decried as traitors by the backbenchers of the MPP. Ideas once confined to the Volkschall now openly circled in the chambers of Capitol Hill. 
cornerstones of American democracy, such as the notion that all men are created equal and that all have the right to life. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness are now brought into question by the faction of Francis Parker Yockey. A rot is set in at America's heart, even in Jim Crow's heyday. Never before was there such a sense that hatred was the way of the world. Before it was quiet, now slowly the fear begins to build. Very soon it could erupt into a scream of hatred, and all of America might be consumed by it. The heart of, the, of, the heart of liberty wavers, indeed. Now, roll back segregationist rhetoric. As much as we want to claim the pride and happiness in our administration's successes, one thing stands as clear as daylight. The people of America stand broken, divided, and at each other's throats. Whether we like it or not, the country would be damned if we continue to two wedge a divide, as it will only serve to promote more outrage and disunity, even if taking action has been our greatest weapon in our successes, thus in our knowledge and the impossibility of America's successes without even a or success without even a crumb of stability, we must roll back some of our more outlandish statements regarding our policies of segregation, although our support base will become more confused over the official uh, they voted for. Like hell, we would allow the nation to break apart more than it already has and stop any process of healing. Besides, no matter what, we will continue to stand up for the state's rights against the federal government, even if we have to smother some of the flames. Plus 20 political power attempting to force the North to accept segregation would be insanity. This will alienate your more radical supporters. This will promote cooperation with the center NPP and the far right NPP. However, this will push Wallace's voter base further right. Now, segregation isn't for everyone. Segregation isn't for everyone. The words which fell upon Americans, whether by ear, by radio, or by television, no matter what, segregation isn't for everyone, were the words that shocked some, relieved some, appalled others, but mostly confused everyone. But more importantly, it was the words that President Wallace knew he had to, to that, that, that knew that, that President Wallace knew had to be spoken in order to patch the wounds dealt to the country after years of breaking apart, even if we have recognized the overstepping committed by the federal government done in the past. We cannot continue to allow a single issue of American society to tear the entire foundation apart. Rather, we will scale back the overall radical take of the administration and allow the people of the United States to solve the issue more calmly before the entire thing blows up in all of our faces. This will implicate the northern states. Political power plus 70, Wallace's voter base will expect more segregation legislation to be passed and the National Progressive's uh, bundle of sticks to wing will grow. What are they currently at? They actually decreased from about 15 to about 11, but now they're back to 13. Very interesting indeed. Now, devolve the choice. This will implicate the northern states. This will push Wallace's voter base further right. Wallace's voter base will start to be more content with the state of states' rights. In our efforts to secure the rights of states for everyone in the United States, and with it please the supporters and opposition of segregation within the school system, now the citizens seem angry over the lack of details. Therefore, so as not to lose the possible solution we have developed for the situation, we will give the states more of what they want, the segregation of water fountains, bathrooms, and public entertainment, such as dances and ball games. And any other and uh, any other debate and segregation shall be opened up to the states. That way, we are in no way betraying our value of states' rights, but also th allowing the opposition of segregation to earn their right as well. Even if the choice seems favourable to the citizens of the United States, especially within our support base in the South, it seems as though that former supporters of our administration have continued to grow disillusioned by our attempts at repair, and we may have a new foe at hand. Very interesting indeed. Now, moderate roots. Before we were the NPP far right, we were the patriotic party, we were led by General Patton and our purpose was to avenge Japanese injustices, not to uphold the racist institutions of southern elites. Time to get our priorities straight and return to being the party of American patriots, whatever their skin colour. LeMay will condemn racism as publicly and, uh, and unambiguously as any man can. He will reach out to rising stars in the party like Margaret Chase Smith and Spiro Agnew, good examples of American patriots who aren't racists. Le, uh, LeMay will restore the NPP far right to what General Patton meant it to be, even if he has to drag the party kicking and screaming back to its roots. The Wallace LeMay ticket was elected on a segregationist mandate and those voters may not react well to the party's new direction. George Wallace's former voter base will leave the far-right MPP leaning on joining the Yankees. Hmm. They should all join soon enough. Alienate segregationists. George Wallace's former voter base will leave the far-right NPP, leaning on joining the Yaquis. We'll appeal to the northern states. President LeMay is no friend to racists. He has made this quite clear after denouncing Wallaceism. Wallace may have left the party a few months, or may have led the party a few months ago. Um, but this is LeMay's party now in the new NPP far-right. Segregationism dies today, is still dead tomorrow, and shall remain dead forever. Anyone who disagrees can find another party. LeMay will make support for integration a requirement for continued membership in the NPP far-right. This will solidify the NPP far-right as a purely patriotic party, not a segregationist pawn. Uh, this may infuriate our southern base, but it, uh, but if they don't appreciate the president doing the right thing, then the president doesn't need them in his party. If they're purged from the NPP far-right, then there will be only one faction left who are segregationists can find a home. Now, the military model to integration. 
George Wallace's former voter base will leave the far right NPP leaning on joining the Yockeys. Army experience plus 25 gain base stability plus 5%. Some businessmen who want to be politicians like to say they'll govern this country like they ran their companies, while President LeMay plans to run this country like a company too, a company of soldiers that is. As CIC, LeMay will give the order to desegregate and by God it shall be done. The armed forces will be desegregated as soon as his pen leaves the paper and this will be the, Ameri the model Americans shall follow. No, yes, this will be the model America shall follow, indeed. And so, the 1968 elections have concluded with President-elect Goldwater being chosen. The Yockeys have come into the American Senate for the first time with 13 seats. The NPP Center gained two seats. The NPP Far Left also came into the Senate, into the Senate for the first time, gaining three seats. The NPP Far Right lost 13 seats. The Republican Party lost four seats, and the Democratic Party lost one seat. The um, Republican Democrats won 291 electoral votes, the NPP's 243. However, the RDs lost the popular vote by roughly 600,000. Hmm. Indeed. This is not a recipe for stability. No, sir. Liberty and justice for all. It gets to vent the Civil Rights Act of 1969. George Wallace's former voter base will leave the far right NPP, leaving on joining the Yaquis. This will increase the status of civil, of civil rights. When Curtis LeMay first took a seat in the Oval Office, he was not the man for the job. Yet over the past several months, he has already upended American politics and remade the NPP in his image. All of his hard work, all his sacrifices, it's all built up to this moment. His magnum opus is present, the Civil Rights Act. Wallace would blow a gasket when he finds out what it contains. This Civil Rights Act is far more progressive than anything John F. Kennedy could have developed. It's astoundingly strict on school segregation and just as brutal on transport segregation. This will hit the Senate floor and LeMay will do everything in his power to push it through. When he leaves office, he will be remembered as the only president in history to have thrown away his entire political future to stand up for the other America. This is a complete portrayal of everything the NPP far right stood for in 1964. Certain forces in this country shall seek revenge. And revenge they shall soon have. But a shoe and a buddy, a few short years. Now, sign the Civil Rights Act. The National Progressive Party looks better in southern states. The Gets Event the Civil Rights Act passes. This will increase the status of civil rights, and the National Progressive Party's bundle of sticks wing will grow. It had taken no small amount of goodwill and political capital, but the President has gathered enough support in Congress to finally push the Civil Rights Act to the Senate and House of Representatives. Now, this piece of tumultuous legislation lies atop the resolute desk, smaller than its many drafts have ever been, and accompanied by somewhat muted jubilation in the Oval Office. All it awaits is a handful of strokes etched in black fountain ink by the highest office in the land to become ironclad law. Indeed. Oh, fuck, I didn't unpause. Um, no, not unpaused, rather, but I am. I did not, um... Faded from black, yes, that was my bad. Close. Um, yes. Gets vent the Civil Rights Act passes. This will increase the status of civil rights and the National Progressive Party's bundle of sticks. Its wing will grow. I suppose it didn't matter too much that I didn't, um... Uh, unfade from black, but... Because it was all reading anyway, but... It's all good. 